new faces, uh, which is great. I think it's, uh, I had no idea there was such an appetite for early Monday mornings and three hour long sessions and, 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 and working sessions of this, so maybe we'll have to, to initiate many more of these. I, I want to say a few words um, both about this morning and, and about the, uh, a couple of the key drivers. I understand Jay Harris is here. Where's Jay? Here. Jay is here who's helped, uh, uh, been, been a real believer in this, helped fund this with the Changing Horizons fu uh, Fund, and I know that uh, Jay will be up and speaking later, but I want to thank you for supporting this project and, and the folks that are here today. I became friends with Jed Schilling uh, at the far end a number of years ago. And at the time, Jed was at the World Bank, and I don't know what role he held, because I think he held about every role other than the president. Uh, otherwise, he might not, you know, he might not be here today. He'd be at AEI or something. Uh, but, but Jed Schilling was at one point uh, running the secretariat. I'm not going to read his formal biography, but he is one of the people who is um, just simply very smart about finance and the applications of finance to many key uh, uh, global problems and, and thinking through dynamic modeling. And we did a program here once at New America Foundation on Finance and the Environment where we were trying then to take uh, what we thought was an avant-garde approach of looking at ways to, to look at raising the costs of, of things you would, uh, that if you could do that, you would otherwise uh, get better behaviors out of complex systems. Um, a lot of that has become conventional now, but at the time we were at the forefront, uh, I thought of, of some very interesting work. And Jed Schilling became a friend and I became addicted to his kind, of, kind of, uh, uh, his kind of stuff. I didn't know very much about the Millennium Institute, and then a couple of years ago he says, why don't we do this thing, I've got a dynamic modeling idea of like we can throw a, you know, it's kind of like horse racing. I have a friend who's a very big gambler, um, <laughs> and, and he's a gambler in uh, Hong Kong, and he's done rather well, and he's got one of these dynamic models and throws in a lot of different factors. I don't know very much about it, about horses, and he does pretty darn well. And I, I used to think, God, if you could do something like this and look at many other factors and look at energy or you look at demographic change or you look at budgetary and fiscal issues, you look at sort of social behaviors writ large and you're able to synthesize uh, uh, serious modeling. And, you know, they're always, they're, you know, the, one of the, I had a, uh, the paper that here's today sent uh, uh, to someone who gave, who raised a couple of issues that were not included. And there's always the case because you're not able to model uh, uh, perfectly um, all of the synergies between different things. But if you're able to take in thousands of comp components and look at dynamic relationships between them, then you're able to get, a, I think, a much better picture, possibly a better picture, um, of, the, of the impact of various policy courses one might take. And we did this, what, two years ago, three years ago three here? Years ago. And it was a superb meeting, which C-SPAN covered. Uh, and I think that it helped take uh, the Millennium Institute, which has already had its own reputation in groups, but it helped, I think, broaden the audience and interest uh, in these issues. So I was um, grateful for Jed Schilling to, to do that. And then some time ago I said, why don't we, we talked about this, why don't we do something on looking at the U.S. energy policy debate, uh, and that's why we're here today. They've, they've got a report that I hope you've gotten here. Um, they're distributing in... Uh, CD form uh, version of the model, which we didn't have the last time we did this. And I want to thank Hans Herren, whom I'm about to introduce here to, to take over the, the helm, who is the president of the Millennium Institute and, and joined in May 2005, which I can't remember. Was that, was that the time we did the C-SPAN talk? No, no, no it was after. after. Yeah, was so, after. so uh, we're sorry we missed you there, but we're glad you're on board now. And, and he is um, the former director general of the International Center for Insect Physiology and Ecology. And he's a, you know, a serious scientist who, who is familiar with many of the uh, uh, applications of complex modeling. And I'm, th I'm very pleased that he is taken on the helm to sort of bring a lot of his practical experience into sort of the broader social agenda uh, and, and applications like we have today to sort of look at the various kinds of policy choices um, on energy, the debate about renewables, CAFE standards, what, what the economic implications are, and what the likelihood is of various policy courses. So uh, I'm just a, uh, an observer here and, and was happy to provide a room. Uh, everything else is these guys, including the uh, fantastic buffet outside, which I may <laughs> go, go home. So without further ado, please, please welcome Hans Herren. Uh, thank you, Steve, for this introduction. Uh, good morning, everybody, and I'm glad to see so many people here this morning also. 
I will uh, give you a, a short introduction to the Millennium Institute so that everybody knows you know, where we come from, sort of what, uh, what we are up to, and um, a few words about why we are here uh, before uh, the specialists will go into more details talking about uh, the issues in terms of energy, uh, climate change, and then looking in more details into the model itself. I hope that uh, this will raise then a number of questions, which we'll be more than happy to answer uh, toward the end of this uh, uh, morning. The Millennium Institute is a not-for-profit organization based out in, in Arlington, so just neighbors here. And it was started in 1983 uh, by Dr. Jerry Barney, who is present here. Uh, Jerry, uh, you can wave, so we, and uh, quite a few of you probably know uh, Jerry, uh, who uh, created uh, the Millennium Institute through a few different iterations, sort of following from the uh, Global 2000 report to the president, uh, of which uh, Jerry uh, was, uh, was the author. In the many years of existence, the Millennium Institute has worked in many countries around the world. I'll show you a map to where we have been present, helping people uh, think in terms of system rather than uh, linear, and that's all what we are about here, is looking at uh, issues in a more holistic way um, to uh, make sure that uh, uh, we take into account many of those uh, feedback, feedback loops, as we will show you later on. And again, uh, many countries and a lot of the issues out there right now, I think, are uh, that we have not been planning well enough for the longer term. If not, we wouldn't be in the bind we are today on many issues, energy, but also development in, in general. And you know that uh, issues of international development or development in, in developing countries are affecting very much what's happening here uh, in the U.S., Europe, and in the developing countries also. So we have done so, a, a number of models to address issues in uh, developing countries, but also decided to do something here in the U.S. where long-term planning is also important and needed. And this was something which was uh, realized by uh, Jerry Barney uh, uh, some years ago and also by Jay Harris, who has been very happy, happily funding uh, uh, this work o over the years, um, together with a few others uh, like Ed Holland from the um, Tidewater Foundation here in um, Virginia. Um, the Liechtenstein uh, government has uh, come in also funding part of this work. Um, and I, I want to thank right now here also uh, the New America Foundation for hosting us here today uh, very kindly. The vision, uh, we mission, obviously like every organization, not for profit in particular, we have our vision and our mission. And we're looking for sort of have a world where again peace is supported by equity and common global responsibility toward uh, the, the generation, the next generations, and also uh, the all life supporting environment. I think it's very important that we are looking after not only ourselves, but uh, our uh, children and the children's children. So uh, again, we're trying with our work to uh, move towards such a vision. And the mission really is to provide tools and educate people around the world uh, to build a uh, consensus among those willing parties who are all sort of looking forward for a more environmentally uh, sound way of working, of developing ourselves in, in, into the future. And again, we have all uh, shared responsibility and that's something we like to make sure people do realize and also know how, about, uh, how to go about it uh, in the future. And um, so how will we uh, so implement our mission and mission? Again, so we will uh, develop and disseminate the advanced analytical, analytical tools. And what we're here today, we want to present you uh, this Threshold 21 or T21 tool, which is um, not an edit itself, but basically something, uh, a tool in a toolbox, which the planners can use when they discuss uh, long-term uh, issues. And so it supports the dialogue um, at community, at national, and also at global levels. And again, I'll show you we have worked in this many different levels right now already with this model. Uh, craft and implement capacity development for a broad cross-section of partners in sustainable development using modern communication means. Again, going out there and making sure that we do network the people who sort of uh, think that we need to change the way we do business. Uh, build a network of supporters and partners 
Uh, this is a tremendous amount of work, cannot be done by one single organization, and so we're always looking out there for partners, and I hope that we may find a few here maybe today uh, to help us along with some more of the uh, details uh, we need to always look at in such complex models. The, one of the ideas is, is to set up, um, not only here in the U.S., but in Europe, in Africa, Latin America, Asia, some centers of excellence where people uh, can start to uh, uh, learn how to think uh, in systems and uh, provide um, uh, sort of the, the seeds for a different uh, way of uh, planning for the longer term future. And we always very happily do uh, apply the lesson learns uh, every day, it brings new lessons. And I'm sure here today with your questions, we again will learn something new. And why is there a need for uh, planning towards sustainable future? Because we all know that we are in a, a fairly tight corner and anyone who read the Washington Post uh, yesterday uh, had three pages full of it on where we're heading. And uh, it doesn't look very good actually, if you think about it. And um, we need to find better solutions and we need to create a consensus. And uh, so how can we deal with this uh, global warming, the energy, pollution, environmental degradation issues? Uh, so we need something to uh, base or to look forward. We, we need a plan. And only if we have a good plan can we then measure progress uh, against that, that particular plan, against the milestone which are in a plan. But a plan like this uh, has to really look at the long term, have, has to have a holistic, a long term holistic vision. Uh, you cannot only just look at the energy issue on its own or environmental issues or social issues uh, disconnected. And what we're trying to do at the Millennium Institute, and that's, that's sort of his its, uh, claim to fame, is that it, it, the, the model, the T21, links the economy with society and the environment. So everything is linked into one single uh, framework, which, although very complex, also remains very transparent, and you will see that. Uh, how this actually can be uh, true, that although uh, complexity can also be shown in, 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 in its simplicity. Uh, we want to make sure that the model is not just something we own, like many uh, organizations own a model and they write a report and sort of put it on the table. What we are trying to do, we are trying to train people, do a capacity development uh, in countries, within institutions, organizations, so that they can actually use the tool themselves, uh, continue to improve it uh, with us if needed or on their own if they want to. The T21 uh, is now an open source uh, program so people can actually download it from the website, uh, work on it uh, as they wish. We uh, want to focus on results because that's what counts. In the end of the day, the people who support us I want to make sure that there is something there which uh, they can, uh, can see, which they can use. And so for us, this is very, very important. And again, we want to remain flexible. So we're, we're, although we have a model, it's up there to be discussed, to be improved over time. And again, we're looking forward always to get uh, feedbacks. And we do get feedbacks from many people we've been working with in the private sector, uh, uh, government, um, to, to improve uh, what we do in universities, etc. And here, just a quick map sort of where we have been or we are present uh, around the world. So you can see we're a bit all over the map um, with different um, activities. So the blue dots represent so where we have like country models, sort of integrated country models. Um, the yellow one, that's where we have head office. Uh, the uh, purple one we do is our sort of home away from home. We do have a number of modelers based at the University of Bergen in Norway where there is a, um, a group of uh, people interested in system dynamics for development. We have another sort of partnership uh, with MIT where system dynamics is mostly applied to business uh, uh, issues. So they are a bit different and so we have those connections. Actually, the, 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 the uh, Jay Forrester professor at MIT for system dynamics, system dynamics uh, uh, John Sturman, is also a board member of MI. Then we have the MI model, which is sort of a, a dynamic model for transportation issues. This is a contract we have with the General Motors. So we're working around the globe with the GM uh, on, on looking at the transportation issues. And we also have done some post-conflict work, bringing the parties in the Balkans after the disintegration of uh, 
uh, Yugoslavia back together on one table to discuss their future. And again, using a system model so they can look at the interaction between uh, their different activities and how can they get back together. So you can see the application of uh, system dynamic models uh, around the globe uh, by MI. And here our concept really is to link the economy, society, and the environment, and basically all together in a dynamic way. So they're all interconnected. Actually, the environment, we could even have a much bigger circle because the economy and society is embedded somehow in the environment. But we keep it like this because it shows sort of the three main elements we're dealing with and we, we, which we do integrate in the model. And um, just this little cartoon here, you know that you have a problem, you push it away. But, but what you need to realize is that usually it comes back to visits very quickly. <laughs> and, uh, and this is basically what we're trying to do with system dynamics. It's, it is, it's always action, it, there's a reaction. Whatever it may be, people call this the unintended intended consequences. And again, so we need to, to uh, think more about uh, this type of issue. So why are we here today? I think we have concerns about medium uh, and energy availability, medium and long-term energy availability, and its critical role in the U.S. and global economy. Um, it's on everybody's uh, agenda, uh, everybody's list of concerns. How are we going to move uh, forward here with, with energy issues and also the link between energy and global warming or climate change? And they are connected. And so again, so how can we deal with some of these? And we will show you how uh, using a dynamic model, uh, we can do. Uh, we can look at this a bit in a different way than sort of the linear way things have been considered so far. And even again in that paper yesterday, you can see that uh, all these relationships are usually linear. And that does the real world doesn't wor work doesn't work like that. Uh, they are concerned that fossil energy sources, even though some are abundant, cannot or maybe should not uh, be used because of the CO2 and impact on global warming. Question is not how much is out there. Can we actually use it? Or if we use it, how can we use it in order not to fry in the next uh, 75 years? And again, the IPCC, which you all know about these reports, show that unless we do something very drastic, uh, we will uh, end up with, with a bunch of problems. And again, well, we, are, we want to look at the problem with an integrated framework, which I showed before, and then Kate, that can take into account the interconnectivity of the different energy and climate change issues. Um, and again, these causal relationships, again, we'll try to highlight them as we go along. So we need to look at scenarios because the only way that we can have a plan is, okay, what if, what can we do? And we'll show you a number of uh, possible scenarios, again, which do uh, look at the larger system and not only just at the narrow energy or energy or climate change, but what are the impacts on society, impact, wider impact on the environment, and in particular, I think, the issues of the um, impact on the economy. Because, I mean, if, if everybody agrees that something has to be done, uh, people cannot come to a consensus on who will foot the bill or, or how are we going to actually pay the bills uh, which were going to come up. And hopefully we can then show also that it's actually maybe not as painful as it seems. <clears throat> and I think that what we have to think really about here, it's not that we make a plan and stick to it like in the Soviet times and all those famous five-year plans which people stuck to it, never matter what happened uh, around them. And I think that, again, although we have to have a plan, it has to be adaptive, it has to be flexible so that we can uh, uh, correct the trend or, the, or the, the course of action as uh, needed. And that's why, again, if you do have a proper plan, you have the milestones and you can measure against it and see are we on track or not. Has the environment around us changed? Do we need to make uh, changes? And we have all seen this one here, and that's why we're worrying right now, is because we are really already way up here in the year 2000, and the prediction goes that we go further up. And you know that in 1947, there was sort of one year with, with a peak and if you look at this now, we are way beyond the, 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 the highest temperature level we had in 1947. And the other big, big worry, I think, is when I said that maybe we have a lot of oil out there or, or, or carbon fossil fuel sources, we can't afford to burn it because although we are here today, uh, projected 
Um, if we continue on the same track, we'll be out there somewhere by 650, 700 ppm of CO2 or CO2 equivalent uh, in the year 2100. And that's uh, not, not very good, as you all know already also. So uh, these are really some of the reasons why we have to do something. And um, if you want to have more maple syrup or still maple syrup in a few years on your pancakes and in the breakfast, we're going to do something because this is what may happen in 2080 if we don't do much about the, the maples will disappear from uh, the, the US. I don't know exactly if we're going to grow them further up in Greenland or in Canada, but certainly we're going to have a problem there with adaptability. Sir, can yeah. you make these available to everyone? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. We'll make, we'll put the presentation onto the website. Yeah, sure. Or we have a stick here. We can just pass it out. At the end, if somebody wants it, yeah. <clears throat> so, what do you want to achieve? So, I think what we want to do is to inform about the availability of complementary and holistic tools. So, that's one thing today here. I want to show you that there are tools available to do what I'm just talked about, and we'll also show exactly how this tool works. Uh, we want to help, basically. We want to help you and the people you work with make informed choices based on preferred uh, worldviews. Because again, not everybody uh, wants to do the same thing. I mean, there's many roads to go to Rome. So are you going to go this way or are you going to go that way? As long as you go to Rome, it's fine. And again, a model like this, which is flexible, where you can play your own scenarios, you can choose sort of your way to get there. And, but also looking at the consequences, because maybe one road goes flat, so it's very easy to go. Your run goes over the mountains very hard, and you may get very tired and never get there. But so, so at least you, you, we, tr we try to give you choices. Um, we want to help you design sensible policies in a world of uncertainty, change and surprises, because there are uncertainties uh, today, even with what we, our assumptions. But again, playing out some of these uh, scenarios would be very helpful actually to look at them and study uh, these uncertainties and make uh, choices based on, uh, on knowing what the assumptions really uh, were in the model. And you can look at them. And we want to promote adaptive policy making for energy resources in the face of climate change. And again, the wider context of the economy, society, and the environment, not just looking at the economy and the energy bits to it, but I think the bigger context, because society is also part of this. And I think we, we will never get around it to think about not only the US, but the rest of the world. As you all know, what in 25 years will be two and a half billion more people out there. So are we going to just drive big cars here with ethanol? Or, you know, I mean, these are questions we have to ask ourselves. Maybe we can, maybe we cannot. But this can, it needs to be played out and, and planned uh, properly. And also we want to help policymakers with new ways to design policies that can adapt to a range of conditions. Again, uh, given the issues out there, and we, we are also aware that there are political realities out there, which again, everyone uh, has on its mind, and so how can we also look at those that take into account? And just here, uh, yesterday's paper, uh, Climate Change Debate Hinges on Economics. That's the big title, three pages of it. and. Um, we believe that there is more than economics. So it's a big thing. But the, what we need to be aware of, and I think it will come out later, is that if we just look at economics, we're never going to do anything. And so how can really move forward? And uh, from the McKinsey report here, which came out recently, uh, you can see that it's an, an issue of trade-off, because this is what we gain, this is what we may have to, to pay, and as uh, uh, David, uh, Sir David King just said a few days ago at the AAAS uh, presentation, if anyone has been there, is that if you eyeball this, you can see that it balances out. So the economics actually will work out, uh, more or less. But somebody has to get started and uh, not say, well, it's too hard today, it's too hard of a de uh, uh, decision to make. Let's put it on, on to tomorrow. Tomorrow it will only cost a whole lot more. So. So much for my own little uh, startup here. So I want to thank you for being here to listen to all this. And um, uh, I hope that we can have sort of a dialogue on this and uh, that we can continue uh, uh, work together. Another of interesting news that just came out this morning is that the House to approve bill um, tomorrow recognizing the importance of tech simulation technology to the security and prospect of the United States. So I think we are. <laughs> We have done this on the right day, again, thanks to the New America Foundation to have planned this, uh, given us the opportunity today to do this uh, presentation here. 
So what I want to do now, I want to um, um, introduce quickly Jay Harris uh, and Jerry Barney. They will make a short statement before we go on into the presentation of them all. Maybe uh, Jay. Thank you, Hans. People who know me uh, realize that I try to stay behind the scenes as much as possible. But I care enough about this um, effort to come down from semi-vacation in Maine and say a few words. I'm delighted to see uh, such a good turnout. It's, it's very encouraging. Um, five years ago, there probably wouldn't have been more than four or five people here. So anyway, um, it's good to show that you have the confidence in the um, system dynamic system. Uh, I might mention my first grant uh, was uh, a couple of small grants to Jay Forrester many years ago uh, for his urban dynamics plans. And um, then after that, World 3, uh, the basis for the world famous limits to growth uh, studies of the Club of Rome. The pessimistic studies convinced me that the future that some of the environmental leaders were talking about was not going to be very pleasant. And um, some of you know that the study has been updated about every 10 years, uh, most recently just three years ago. And uh, when I get back to Maine, I'm going to uh, send people who ask me, uh, give me their cards, uh, a, a synopsis of that study, um, and because um, it's we had uh, I don't know um, we had an environmental media service do it for us. Uh, I was also very much uh, impressed with the Global 2000 report to the president uh, Jimmy Carter, so that goes way back also, and the subsequent work that Jerry Barney did to help other nations improve the chances for stability through the Millennium Institute. By the way, how many of you, uh, kind of a show of hands, uh, know about the Clu uh, Global 2000 report? Well, it just goes to prove that you've got to reinvent the wheel every, every generation. Um, it, I just might, uh, Jerry's following me and, and he doesn't know what I'm going to say and I, uh, I'm not sure what he's going to say, but, but he was a director of that report. He, uh, it was sponsored by CEQ and particularly uh, Ed Muskie, who was uh, then Secretary of State. And it was distributed to the world embassies and to a lot of people around here. And rumor has it that uh, when Reagan came in, he burned them all. <laughs> Uh, um, the Global 2000 report was not a, a computer study, but it did use the system dynamics type of thinking in order to try to integrate some of these interrelated problems. Um, so I was an early contributor to Jerry uh, and the Millennium Institute for that purpose. But then I got more and more discouraged and frustrated the way the United States was going. And after a number of conversations with Jerry, I agreed to ante up additional funds for the construction of this American model uh, for two primary reasons. Uh, one, to change the actions and the policies of the United States, which I believe were more and more destroying the world. And because if we were destroyed or really uh, knocked down a lot, the rest of the world would have problems, major problems. Uh, but I want to suggest a next step beyond that, and, and maybe Jerry will talk a little bit more about um, the Global 2000 report. But at one time, before the current administration came in, I had hoped that a new and different administration could do a Global 2000 type of report, but this time a system dynamics-based report to an interested administration. Some parts of this report could be based on and much time saved if some of this work done here today, or done by the Millennium Institute, uh, would kind of form the basis for this. Uh, I'm well aware that such a report would take a, um, 
a magnet uh, to in, in magnet in order of magnitude increase in financing, and it would need a well diversified steering committee and a desire upon the members of that committee not to fight over territory and to keep politics uh, to a minimum. Uh, I think the latter problem is probably more than uh, more important than the funding aspect of it. And then, of course, the, 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 we would try to keep it completely out of politics, uh, but when the right time came, I, I would hope that uh, various groups would join in trying to get some common sense into our, into our thinking. Uh, I would like to end by saying that I believe that, with some major exceptions, and I'll just mention Lester Brown, uh, there are plenty of people like Les who are, are really good. Uh, the human mind has not been given enough foresight, wisdom, analytical ability, or I am very much afraid, really caring about the future. A uh, generation of humankind or gods of other creatures to save us from impending doom. Unless we properly use the technical ability of computer models, and we don't need to go, you know, <laughs> they're good computer models and bad, but we know what we're talking about. The ones we're talking about are good computer models. And I hope that some of you uh, this morning with a desire to use this T21 model for your own benefit as well as for the tough decisions to develop long-term U.S. policies toward a sustainable nation and world. Politics obviously hasn't worked. Perhaps T21 and more effort and coordination among you can bring some better results. Perhaps the System Dynamics Organization can help in a coordinated effort. But you here today and people you know of could be an important factor in improving our future. I hope very much that you'll be able to do that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jay, and also thank you for your support for this cause. Uh, Jerry, can you say a few words also, please? <clears throat> and you all, Jerry is former president of the Millennium Institute. Well, thank you, Hans. Uh, I will be quite brief. Uh, I have retired, and uh, in, in my retirement, I've started a new organization, <laughs> uh, an international network of young people who are trying to, to develop a plan for how to get themselves, their children, and the earth uh, safely through the 21st century. And uh, those of you who have not seen the, the original Global 2000 study, uh, that now has been scanned and is on our website, OurTask.org, uh, uh, and if you are interested in it, you can get it there. I'm mainly interested in hearing the presentation, so I'm not going to talk very much, but I do want to say uh, that as the past president of Millennium Institute, it's, uh, it's a very good feeling to see Hans and Chad, Andrea and Wei Song here in the back, and uh, Matteo I don't think is here, but you know, the team that is carrying on this work, and I, uh, I have long been looking forward to having a Threshold 21 model of the United States. So now I want to see it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Jerry. So we'll uh, go on the next presentation uh, by uh, Jed. I mean, that, that's not the introduction. That's just uh, <laughs> that's the slide in between, <laughs> which uh, <laughs> before your presentation comes on. So, okay, Jed, go ahead. Press the next button. <laughs> <laughs> See if we. Oops. There we go. Well, first, thank you all very much for coming. I express my appreciation to Steve Clements and the America, the New America Foundation, for hosting us here. Uh, to Jay and to Jerry for their work setting this whole program up. Hans for carrying it forward, um, and you all for coming and listening. I want to do a brief uh, background presentation of what the real challenges are and a little bit about the modeling approach, and then we will turn it over to Andrea to get into the details of the model itself and the kind of results it can produce. 
So the real challenge is energy is essential for continuing growth in the United States. We know that we need it for our business, for our homes, for travel, for whatever purposes that we need to do it. And if we look out using the model, here's an estimate of the amount of energy demand in the United States through 2020, uh, 2050. And it's about double what it is now in 2050. And the different colors, this is petroleum, gas, coal, uh, nuclear, and renewable energy sources. So we can see the distribution. Uh, that's quite a bit of growth when we look at the potential constraints that we have out there on these kinds of energy and some of the problems that they generate. Um, other countries are even growing faster than the United States and their demand for energy is growing faster so we're getting a lot more competition around the world and the total demand for fossil fuels is growing quite substantially. Now the thing that we've come to realize about fossil fuels is the amount of, of fossil fuels stored in the earth is fixed. We may not know quite how much, but we know it's not going to go on indefinitely. It's getting harder and harder to get out, so it's going to be more difficult to meet the growing demand. And this is what the world uh, demand for fossil fuels is going to look like between now and 2050. And we can see already somewhere in the 2020s, uh, petroleum reaches a peak and starts going down. It doesn't go over a cliff, but the amount declines. For gas, uh, that'll happen around 2050, and coal will be the remaining fossil fuel that we have and the major source of energy, subject to all of the problems uh, of mining and burning coal that have to be addressed. So energy production and consumption, while they're necessary for growth, contribute to things like climate change and other kinds of pollution. Uh, and can lead to significant amounts of global warming, which has a whole range of other negative impacts. So the challenge we face is how do we maintain growth and deal with the constraints on energy and still manage global warming and other environmental factors? These are all linked. You can't address one or the other separately. You have to look at them together. So we're really facing an energy revolution that we're going to have to manage. We've had the agricultural revolution. We've had the industrial revolution. Now we're going to have an energy revolution and change the kind uh, of the way we use energy, the way we produce energy, and how it's distributed. Um, the other uh, revolutions, let's just assume there was always going to be plenty of energy because they used it tremendously. We now know we can't make that assumption any longer, and we need to address the uh, energy revolution and dealing with the potential shortages, the sources of conflict, because we know from all kinds of previous experience. When critical resources get short, people start fighting over them. You know, we face that with energy, we're going to face that probably with water, is you're going to want enough for you and your family, your community, your country, uh, so that we face potential conflicts. And we need to see if we can develop new sources of energy, most of which will be varying varieties of transforming solar energy, which is actually the source of energy in fossil fuels. It's just been accumulated over millions and millions of years, and we've been using it over decades. Um, so we need to figure out how to deal with the risks from conventional sources, how to take advantage of known technologies to improve and develop new resources uh, and benefit from the incentives uh, to make sure this revolution moves down the right path and not down a path toward conflict or something like that. Or we may face an energy crisis. And there's a lot of different kinds of energy crises that we can look at. And we've looked at one here. And this is a, what would happen to the, in our model, uh, the price of world uh, oil um, if there were a 15% reduction in the availability of oil on the market for, over a longer period of time. For example, the conflict in the Middle East might lead to the withdrawal of certain sources of uh, oil or things like that. The price would peak. People would rapidly <coughs> extract energy from other sources available, which would deplete the amount that could be taken out of them. So the price would fall down. And then when we reach the total global peak, go back up again much sooner than would be the base case if nothing horrible had happened. Now, if that looks manageable, the next thing we look at is what does it happen to GDP growth in the United States? There's a little dip. Because of the efforts to get more energy, it goes back up. The blue is the crisis case, and the, the red is the regular one. 
And then GDP growth would decline over a long time because of lower energy availability, consistently higher energy prices, and a number of other factors that the model takes into account. And when we go over in detail, we can explain it. But this kind of thing could cause a real problem. If we were able to invest early in alternate sources and conservation, we could reduce those negative impacts significantly. That would be a matter of insurance, but it would be worth considering. So in dealing with energy, we need, in the course of the modeling and our thinking, to look at energy sector prospects. So what's likely to happen? Well, this is the demand we talked about a moment ago, but this is what's going to happen to the price of energy. It's going to take a big peak and stay high. So we're going to have to deal with much more expensive gasoline for our cars or what have you. Right. Jay, go back on that. Uh, I think so. What's the assumption that it's going to get very expensive? I mean, what are you basing that on? This is uh, the base case, and this is when we reach the oil peak. Got it. Okay. Um, and we don't know exactly when that's going to be, but it's roughly that period of time. And this is what happens to our oil imports in the United States. They keep going up here, and then as the world supply goes down and other countries get interested in it, it goes back down. So that's just looking at one part of the picture. And we then need to think about what are going to be the impacts with other sectors. I mean, the price of oil going up is going to have a big impact on automobile demand, on other kinds of productions. These are built into the model. And as we see, we look over a longer period of time because many times things in the next two or three years may not be that bad but the effects over a longer period of time can be quite serious. And then we'll look at what kind of policies can be done to improve some of those situations. And I'm just giving you a little snapshot. We'll get the whole model uh, later on. But in this case, we look at what happens when we put in uh, CAFE standards and promote renewables and conservation. Uh, this would be what happens to the available re availability of renewables and GDP would grow much faster than in the other case. Then you can look at other alternatives as well. And as we will see in a moment, these things have some positive impacts and sometimes some not so positive impacts that have to be taken into account. So Threshold 21 model, as Hans has talked about, is designed to help deal with the kind of complexity on these issues that we really have to face in the real world. Um, and just to speak for a moment about models and why they're useful. I spent much of my career at the World Bank doing models for countries, starting off with basic models and working to computable general equilibrium models, um, which were interesting, except I had a little problem with them in that applying it to countries was fine from a theoretical point of view, but I'd never seen a country in equilibrium. So what was the model representing? <laughs> and I had started off being very skeptical of system dynamics model, and having met Jerry and gotten introduced to T21 and stuff, I came to realize and become very devoted to the fact that this is a very powerful modeling tool because it's much more representative of reality and it has much more of the kinds of feedbacks that you're likely to get. And let me just go through briefly that what models do, they try to help you understand and put down on paper increasingly complex um, relationships and see what how they represent as a, you know, as a picture of reality or some portion of reality and identify important links. And in a linear and a system dynamic approach, this is the way we would look at something, a part of the way we would look at something. If we oppose the, impose the CAFE standards, it would raise fuel economy. So a higher standard means a higher fuel economy. That's what the plus means. And these relate to real equations underneath, but it's easier to explain the relationship here. As the CAFE standard goes up, the cost per mile goes down and the gasoline consumption goes down. That's what the negative sign there means. And that means that gasoline expenditure will also go down because the cost per mile goes down, a positive relationship, the gasoline expenditure. And that's the kind of models lots of people are using. And in the um, Washington Post report yesterday, they had a number of these relationships in individual sectors. So just keep that in mind for a minute. I'm going to come back to this momentarily. We use these models to project results. So they would say, OK, we know how much a higher CAFE standard will reduce gasoline consumption, so we'll know it's going to be going down that much in the future. 
Um, then as models become bigger and larger, they get very complex, and we look at them as black boxes, and we say, I don't know if I can trust this big, huge, complex model that takes a computer a long time to run and produces these numbers at the other end. Um, and they can also get very narrowly focused in the sense if you're doing a sector model in, say, energy, you can have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of equations that will just deal with one or two specific issues, which is good for that sector, but they assume everything else just stays the same. And that's a problem when you get into a, a global framework. Um, and then we get into the mental models. I call these the gray boxes because even in, you know, a modeler's mind like mine, I can only keep track of a few things. And then you go out and say, well, I don't know the rest of the details, but this seems logical to me. And there was a re book that just came out the other day that says most people make political discussion the decisions ma based on their emotional feelings, not about any really serious analysis because they don't have enough details and stuff like that. So we have to deal with that. And that's why T21 is so useful because it's very transparent and you can see and get a much better feel of how various things react and, and relate to each other. So as I said, system dynamics is based much more on reality and how things actually work and the feedback that we get. So if we go back to this little uh, standard uh, equation I started out with, relationship, and we get to here and we have, because of the higher can, uh, cafe standards, reduced expenditures on gasoline. Well, we look at that and as gasoline costs less, people end up driving more. Well, if they end up driving more, they end up consuming more gasoline. So the initial model that said the consumption was going to go down 20%, turns out it'll only go down 10% because of this feedback loop. Now, there are other feedback loops that if you spend less on gasoline, you're going to spend more on food, on your house, on other things. Well, all of those things consume energy as well. GDP will go up, but you'll still get even more total energy consumption. That's what this kind of model really does, is it looks at those feedback loops, how they help each other, uh, or how they interact with each other, and you can get a much broader, clearer picture of what's going to happen. And it's not just a straight line, everything's going to go this way because of the various feedback loops. So we do that, we work, as I said, in a longer time frame, and because of the graphics, and, and Andre will show you much more about that, uh, we can begin to see transparently what happens. And this particular, model, particular modeling technique has another thing I'm very, very impressed with, which is called causal tracing. And you can go and look at any result in the model, and Andre will show you how to do this and say, why did this happen? And it will go back and say, okay, here is the equations, the factors that fed into that, and here's how big an impact each one of these had on that result. You say, okay, well, this looks a little funny. So you go back another step. And you can go back tens or more of steps to find out what, what caused a certain set of results. And I don't know of any other modeling technique that allows you to do that. So this is another important thing in using the model as an analytic tool. Um, and then you compare results across different hypotheses. And in this case, we looked at the impact of the CAFE standard on gasoline consumption. And it clearly goes down, and in fact, gasoline consumption levels off in the set of assumptions behind that. And GDP does better because, as I said before, as you spend less on gasoline, you'll spend more on other things, and this will cause a positive impact on GDP. Now, there are a lot of other factors in here that we'll look at in a moment, too, that will get you along these ways. So. T21, as a model, gives you a chance to see and paint a whole picture uh, across the environment, <coughs> society, health, education, things like that, and the environment, and how they ha handle energy requirements, what the results are going to be, where you're going to have some other factors you're going to have to take into account and do some mitigation or something like that. So you recall Hans's three little circles. It's a little more complex than that, particularly with energy, where here you have all of the economic factors, the environmental factors, and the social factors, and their links to energy. Now, when you get down to the actual model, it's even more complex, but I don't want to overburden you with too much on this sort of thing. So T21 really expands other modeling by incorporating many different sectors. And we don't pretend to build each one of these sectors. We go out with the various experts for the energy sector, for population, 
uh, dynamics for other things, take the best available work, which are sector specific, and integrate them into a single whole with the linkages across the sectors. So you can say, okay, there's going to be an impact uh, from the environment, pollution things will have an impact on health and the population, uh, education will have an impact on productivity, a whole bunch of relationships like that that most models don't take into account. The other thing that we do with this model, and, and, and Andrea can show you more, is we calibrate it against history. These projections, as you noticed, started back in 1980. So from 1980 to 20, uh, 2005 or 2006, we're projecting what our model would generate and comparing it with the actual historical data. And this helps us gain confidence that the model is representing the reality out there and what's happening. And actually in building the model, it helps us improve the model because if there are significant gaps between what it's projecting and what's actually happened, we go back and look and say, why did this thing happen? Now, we can't pick up short-run variations and fluctuations that an election result or something might cause something to blip up or blip down a little bit. But we're very close on the trends, so we have a pretty good relationship of what's going on. And I would challenge most any other model to do this. Some have done fairly well. Most don't do that. They just say, starting from now, we're going to go forward. So that's an important thing, and you can begin to see how things are changing over time. Um, the other thing is we don't pretend this is producing an ideal result. This is not an optimization model that says this is what would be perfectly the case if everything went according to theory. This is trying to replicate what's likely to happen given the, the world out there and how uh, things work. So it's a tool to help people make analysis. It's not a partisan model that's showing this or that or the other is the best solution. You can test solutions. You can modify it as you need to. And if people have different views, you can test different views against history to see if those sets of relationships are actually valid and then see what the relationships are. So it's really designed to test different assumptions and hypotheses, compare the results over time to help people make uh, better decisions. And that's critical because you have to work together to make a decision. If you don't make a decision, you're going to probably go down the worst case path or something close to it. Uh, so you have to figure out a way to go ahead. And it also will uh, identify some not so positive side effects that you maybe didn't think about. We talked about the CAFE standards, reducing gasoline consumption, uh, improving GDP and stuff. So we look at CO2 production, same runs. These three are the, four are the base case, the CAFE standard, uh, imposing CAFE standards, imposing improved renewables and combining the renewable and the CAFE. Almost no change at all in CO2 emissions. If we add conservation, significant conservation activities, we can reduce the growth of CO2 emissions, but they're still 50 to 100 percent higher in 2050. So while we may have solved or addressed a number of the energy problems with these particular policies, we haven't really addressed global warming the way we want. So that there has to be more effort put back into that. That's again why having a fully integrated framework gives you a lot more information about what you have to deal with. Not all of it is necessarily welcome information, but to make better decisions or promote better decisions, you need this kind uh, of modeling structure. So to introduce you to, to Threshold 21, um, it's adapted this version to address critical issues in the USA. It doesn't cover everything. It covers a lot, and we're working with ASPO and others to expand the range of things it can cover. Mostly focused on energy alternatives at this stage. We haven't, other than producing CO2 emissions and things like that, addressed the total likely impacts on global warming and some of those things. But those are the kinds of things that can be built in as we expand the model in other areas, and we look for partners to do that. As I said, we validated it. Um, against the past 25 years of experience so we can see how close we're able to track what's actually going on. And then we can test the results of a lot of different approaches. And in the version that Andre will show you today, we have, I think, six or seven different policy options that we can do. Policies and assumptions. Yeah, and assumptions that we can test in a user version, which is the version you can pick up and play with on your own. Now, the model itself, and Andrea, can use it to test a lot more different options. That's just not built into this particular user version. But if somebody wanted it for a specific set of tests, 
it can be adapted to say you can try this 10 or 15 set of policy assumptions or things or this one or any one. And when you really get in and learn the model, you can go in and test anything. So the model is, is very adaptable, uh, but just to make it easy for users, the user version has a limited number of things you can test. And try different levels of CAFE standards, different assumptions about uh, public, public, public reaction and stuff like that. So by providing the analysis and the results of these different things, it can help people reach an agreement or move them in that direction about what's likely, what the effects are going to be. And this is very important in the political process because that's where a lot of these decisions have to be made. Some can be made by individuals. A lot of these decisions are being made at the state level rather than the national level. But if we can get people to come and say, okay, this is a reasonable set of things that produces good results, we might be able to make more progress in that area. If people continue fighting and say, well, my idea says this and my idea says that and they can't agree, you get no decision. And that is worse than probably any of the individual <laughs> decisions uh, that would have been taken. Not all of them, but many of them. So with that, uh, let me stop now. Um, I'll take a few questions and then I want to turn it over to Andrea uh, to give you a detailed inside view of the model and run various tests and see how it works. Have you considered forcing functions like taxes or uh, artificial increases in medicine? Uh, we have in here uh, carbon tax, fuel tax, uh, we can include uh, requirements. I mean, CAFE is kind of an artificial thing, but there are a number of other things that we can do as well. So yes, we can put any of those in. Is the model putting in any sensitivity parameters, mainly as to how sensitive some of the input parameters are to small changes? Yes. Particularly the course of the population shift? Yes. Uh, Andre will show you that, but we can do a wide range of sensitivity analysis to see how you know, some things are quite sensitive, some things are not, and you could look at any of the, any of the results to see which ones are. Do you have a, uh, a mechanism to input rapid technology changes? Yes. In fact, one of the tests he uses does have technology changes. So those kinds of assumptions, you have to say, well, the rapid technology change, does this increase efficiency by 20% rather than 10%, or does it... Uh, increase extraction rates or things like that, but whatever you specify as a technology change, some of them are built in, others can be added. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. You can put that in and see what the results are going to be. <laughs> um, we haven't got that separately, but we've been working with some people from the Pentagon <laughs> to think about how to do that. Hmm? Yeah. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that you account for growth in GDP uh, corresponding to people spending less money on fuel. Uh, so I'm wondering if people are consuming more products, are you accounting for the extra energy consumed in creating those products? Exactly. That's why the CO2 emissions kept going up, even though you were um, and that was that was a, um, a reflection of the increased energy. But yes, we do account for that. In, in the CO2 production, have you included in the GNP the effect of what would occur with respect to the ocean levels rising and problems on that sort? Not of yet. I don't think. Not yet. That's the next stage that we would like to think we about. We represent climate change and temperature change, but we do not represent the impact that that would have in the United States, apart from the, uh, the impact on the world. Yeah. Yes. yes. It's more of a national model yeah. so far, yes. Have you looked at improving the energy efficiency of the existing building stocks, existing homes? Yeah. It's, it's not disaggregated, not in details, but yes. Yeah, in aggregate. Uh, we have included their demand for fossil fuels at this stage. We, we hope to go and extend this to uh, six or seven regional models that add up to a global model, and then we would look in more detail at those. But that's a couple of steps down the road. Now, if these are individual detailed questions about the model, 
maybe it would be better to turn it over to Andrea. If it's a broader question in general about my presentation, then I'd be happy to answer it. But I think we're just getting into his presentation a little step at a time. Did you? Go ahead. Uh, I'm Victor Basker, a consultant in national security policy. What bothers me about your model is you call it a holistic model and say economy, society, and environment, and you pay merely lip service to political realities. Uh, it was mentioned as a term political realities, but we have major discontinuities in, in, in history and in the future. One major discontinuity was collapse of the Soviet Union. Now, energy is being used as a weapon of, uh, in, the, in political game. Power, prices are increased and so on and so forth. The second major discontinuity which is coming is the, uh, the decline of the United States in relative power. In six years, China will have GDP which will exceed <coughs> which will exceed that of the United States. Now, another major discontinuity, and this is more in the economic uh, area, and you are primarily focusing on the economic and not political realities, is uh, methane hydrates. What about methane hydrates? You didn't mention, uh, mention it anywhere. Well, methane hydrates, the, the total amount of energy content of methane hy hydrates is equivalent to the total amount of coal, gas, and, uh, and the total energy content of everything else. Yeah. Now, I talked to, uh, uh, to Edie Allison about three weeks ago, and she said that they expect, that is the United States expects to, to produce methane hydrates by, uh, by 2015 from Alaska. By 2025, it will be produced uh, globally you know, for, from ocean areas. Now, this would be a revolutionary for, for your uh, oil consumption. Where does it stand? So you have to look into this continuities, not just linear continuity of everything. And this is what you're focusing upon. And I don't think it's good enough. Well, I appreciate your comments and suggestions. Uh, we're not linear. There's a lot of this is nonlinear. In terms of the political discontinuities, it's very hard to model and predict them. But as I gave you the case where there was a sharp decline in oil, and we can look at the impacts of that if you want to assume that the Soviet Union is going to be the source of a big cutback or they're going to have certain policies that drive up the price of oil, that can be incorporated in along the lines of the case where I said this is what happens when there was a 15 percent reduction in available uh, oil. In terms of the uh, changing relative economic strength, uh, part of that is in the model when we get to a global stage we will have much more in the competing demand of China and others for um, energy and things like that. Now, if the China, Chinese economy gets to be bigger than the U.S., that won't immediately drive us off the planet. It may change our growth rate or things like that. But there are a lot of former imperial empires around the world that are still surviving reasonably well. They just lack the power that they used to have. Look at England, look at Holland, and places like that. But if there are more information and details about that that you think are important to incorporate in the model, it is relatively easy to do. The last thing about the, uh, was it methane? Methane hydrate. Methane hydrate. Um, that's the kind of technology, if we had the data and the information, can be incorporated to say, if that occurs in 2015 or whatever it is, there'll be a significant increase, if not in renewable, in a new type of energy. We would need to get information about, does the production of that create uh, CO2? Does it require water? Does it have these other impacts? So we could build in the feedback loops. But this is the reason that we like to have these discussions, because we get more information about what we can put in. The model is holistic in that it tries to link all these things together. I don't pretend to say it's complete. But it doesn't necessarily have everything in it, but in our discussions with a number of people, as we get more information, we then are able to incorporate that in the model as well and say, as one option, if we get the methane hydrate coming on stream at this rate, what's going to be the impact on everything else? That may be the ultimate solution. We don't know. But I mean, this is where we need to get more input and information about it, because as I say, we don't know everything about everything. 
we can only bring together as much information as we can gather and that there's general support for it. So thank you very much for your comments. Now, um, Maybe we should, yeah. do we want to take a quick break, uh, give you a chance to get a cup of coffee or something? Yeah, everybody's, yeah. Quick one, about five minutes. All right, make sure nobody disappears, please. Yeah. The, the, the beef is coming now, right? The real, the real beef is. The real beef, real deal. Yeah. The real beef yeah. Yeah. If I could predict it. Okay, uh, uh, Andrea is our senior, one of our senior modelers, is based in Bergen, and uh, he will uh, show you some of the, the innards of the model and how it works, and also uh, answer some questions at the end of the day. Maybe just one comment, sort of based on the question that came before. I really want to say that uh, a model is always work in progress, and uh, any model will tell you that uh, it's never finished. And that's why, again, we welcome uh, uh, ideas and, and, and questions here. Uh, some may end up actually improving the model eventually. So, um, again, it's not the final thing. And uh, I hope also that you will pick up the report out there. There's a CD also where you can uh, play around with the model. It's a run-only version where you cannot make changes, but you can go inside and, and look uh, and play around different scenarios on, on your own already. Okay, Andrea, go ahead. So thank you, Hans, and welcome, everybody. So I would like to start this presentation. I will show you the actual user interface of the model. So exactly what you find in the CD, what are the main functionalities, options you can select. Move yes. the microphone a little closer. Thank you. And you will see what are actually the changes you can make with the model and simulate your own scenarios. You can change policies and assumptions. And I would like to mention also that every model should be built around a specific set of issues. We cannot use models to represent the entire world. The model would be useless. I mean, we start from one point and we end up nowhere. We, we don't even know where we're going if we don't have a specific set of issues we want to analyze. So this model is built around the set of issues that is highlighted, described in the report you have. You can find all the assumptions about the base scenario. I will mention some of them, but if you, don't, if you disagree about the, the base scenario, the, the projections I will show, feel free to ask me questions. I will tell you what are the main reasons, well, why this behavior comes out of the model. So as I said, this is the interface that you'll find in the CD. It's a 10 megabytes file. You can install it on every laptop, computer, and it runs on Windows. So, so this interface is divided in three main sections. There is review, where you can look at the structure of the model, look at the concept, how the model brings together society, economy, and environment, and the linkages with energy. You can compare the behavior of the model with history, and there are 1,400 data series you can use to compare and challenge the model. And then you can run your own simulations and check the results of existing simulations. In the report, you will see we simulate the CAFE standards. We simulate an improvement of uh, renewable energy production. We combine those. We simulate also an increase in conservation. We create a bright future scenario, so a very optimistic scenario, and a worst case scenario. Those are all in the interface. So you can, at any time, you can pick them up and compare the results with your own scenarios or the base case. And every simulation you run is stored on your computer. So if you run a simulation today, in a week from now, you can always call it back. So let's start from review, the first section. Here you can have a look at the concept. You are already more or less familiar with it. We have three main spheres, society, economy, and environment, and then energy. There are, of course, the model is not built on three spheres only. Each sphere is built up on six sectors. So you see, for example, society accounts for population, for health, calculates labor, education and poverty, for example, and the economy calculates investment, production, technology, the rest of the world, and government revenues and expenditures. And the environment accounts for land, water, emissions, and minerals and climate change. The energy sphere contains energy production, supply, all endogenously calculated, both for the United States and the rest of the world. China and India are disaggregated, so fossil fuel demand, oil, coal, and gas demand for China and India is calculated and disaggregated by the rest of the world. And we calculate energy prices, costs, investments. We represent the real system. We look at causal relationships instead of looking at past behavior. So we don't project by looking at what happened. We want to see what are the main forces driving the behavior of the system. That is why you see all these connections. So for example, if you expand society, we see that energy is related to health. And it's related, for example, to labor. Investment in energy allows us to build up infrastructure, and this requires labor. So employment increases. 
And if we add economy, we see the energy is related to the government through, for example, taxes, gathering taxes. Production, GDP needs energy. And technology influences energy consumption, for example. And when we look at the environment, we see there are many linkages with land, with utilization of minerals, with climate change, and with sustainability issues. So going back to the main concept, uh, we can also look at some loops. Uh, these loops are similar to the one that Jed showed earlier about the CAFE standards. It's a simplified way to represent the structure of the model. So here you can really see what are the main causal relationships. This is a similar graph to what has been shown earlier, and CAFE standards and what can be unintended consequences, which are represented as reinforcing or balancing loops. Then we have, for example, technology, where we see that if we invest in energy efficiency, we will consume less. Right here, energy demand will be lower, but with lower energy demand, energy prices are likely to go down since energy demand supply balance is very tight. And when energy prices go down, GDP goes up. Energy demand increases. And when energy prices go down, energy demand directly goes up. We consume more. At the same time, a positive effect is that when GDP goes up, if the energy price go down, there will be a higher investment in energy technology. So energy efficiency will be higher and demand will be reduced. So there are a number of loops that are considered in the model. Other example accounts for oil demand and supply, utilization of resources and reserves for oil, what happens when we invest to develop, explore, produce, recover more. There are different loops involved in the process. What are the linkages between energy and GDP? Clean investments, GDP provides taxes, increases rock government revenues. As a consequence, the expenditure can increase. And then private investment and public investment as GDP grow will grow as well. And in turn, GDP will increase. This drives all the other feedback loops we mentioned, feedback loops we mentioned about energy demand. Higher GDP, higher energy demand through prices. And you can find also one diagram about biofuels. So the relationship between energy and biofuels is sort of a competition. We look at prices, if biofuels become profitable, then demand will shift from oil towards substitute. And we use biofuel in this model at this stage as a case study. So we are not looking into details, where do you get biofuels from? It's just one fuel, and you can select different options to see what will be the future development of price, for example. Technological development and the adoption process, so demand for biofuels, is endogenously calculated by the model. So you have the possibility to change some parameters, but then it's the model itself that calculates demand and adoption. Now, going back to the menu, if we look at the behavior of the model against historical data, you will see that a few indicators have been selected. So the model accounts for a large number of variables, so about 3,500 variables. Most of them are endogenously calculated. About 450 are exogenous or constant, could be policy variables or constant parameters. Here we selected just a few. We have some indicators for society and the economy, including total population. Uh, which is also divided into population pyramid. So let's see, for example, total population. This is one of the main outputs you get from the model. It's time-based graph. You see three lines. We have the simulation against historical data starting from 1980 until 2006, represented by the blue line. The historical data are this red line, which is overlapping with simulation. And future projection is this red line here. So this is the usual output you find. And you can select every single variable in the model and check its behavior. So it, in this sense, we are very transparent. Then as I said, population is also represented as a pyramid in different age cohorts. So if we start from 1980, you see what could be the development of population from the future. There is this population wave, baby boomers. And if you select, for example, the year 2000, you see that this is moving up. So there is an aging chain process embedded in the model. In 2005, we move a little bit further. 2010, it'll be more. Now here, we have less lines because there is no historical data. 2015, even more, 2020, and so on. So population dynamics is represented in the model, endogenous represented in the model. Other variables include life expectancy, state for society. For the economy, we have real GDP, GDP growth rate divided also into different sectors, agriculture and industry and services. This is the three main sectors we represent. And then we have energy and environment. We can look at, for example, total energy demand. Here we have um, calibrated this model to, to be able to represent projections 
from different organizations. So the economic part is based on the CBO, Congressional Budget Office, and the Government Accountability Office, and the Bureau of Economic Analysis Projections. The energy and environmental part is focused on the Energy Information Administration Projections, and so on. So these data for energy are from the EIA, basically. And here again you see historical data, the green line, past projection, the blue line, and future projection, the red one. For what concerns can be changed since we mentioned it earlier, we had greenhouse gas emissions, per capita emissions. So we can see that greenhouse gas emissions are increasing, as Chad shown, uh, shown earlier. Then per capita emissions are somehow constant because the increase in greenhouse gas emission is just about the same as population increase. So the growth rate of emission is similar to population growth. We, have, we can compare the emissions with respect to GDP, so emissions per unit of GDP, and we see this is decreasing due to energy to improve the efficiency and so on. And we can also compare the U.S. emissions with respect to the rest of the world. So we say that U.S. account for about 22% of total world global emissions. And we can look at the behavior for the future, behavior of the model projections for the future. Climate change is also represented, and this is the temperature change and is in line with the IPCC projections. So. Uh, here we use a longer time frame, but we project more or less about a one degree centigrade change over the next 50 years. So something we mentioned earlier was uh, oil price. And I want to give you an explanation of why do we get this specific behavior from oil price here in the base case. So this is the behavior for the average oil price in the US. Now to make sure that you understand how the model, why the model is transparent, we can go through the behavior and say, Oil prices based on availability of resources, reserves, demand supply balance. So we see oil price until now has been increasing over the last few years, and then it's projected to be somewhat constant in the future. Then it starts increasing around 2020. This is due to the peak of oil production. Peak of oil production in the model by looking at the EIA data and production is assumed to happen around 2020, 2025. There is a bit of a range. There will be a plateau phase that I will show later. And then oil price will be increasing even further because of substitution. We assume that biofuel is available for substitution, but there is a five years delay before you can actually build up infrastructure capacity and then produce. So with demand ever increasing for, for energy, for oil and substitutes, it will be hard to keep up with biofuel production to close this gap. And this happens at about this time. The gap is closed, but since there will be less oil available, U.S. oil price would be more expensive than the average world oil price because of the depletion process, because of the higher production cost in the United States, then all the oil available, uh, all the oil produced in the United States will be used for domestic consumption. Because we assume that when we reach the peak, this could be one of the critical reasons we mentioned, it will not be possible to import all the oil needed from abroad. So oil production, domestic production will be used, and what is left, if available, will be imported. Otherwise, the price will go up and demand will be reduced and shifted towards biofuel and substitutes. Now, we'll show you how to look into this with causal tracing. So you can look at this uh, by checking equations, the equations we use to simulate the model, or by looking at the behavior of different variables and compare those. Now, the most interesting part of the model is run, where you can run your own simulation. As I said, you can create a new scenario, add a name. I'll just use my name for this simulation. And you are prompted to the policy intervention choices screen. Here we have some policies that can be changed, gasoline tax, for example, or income tax, or introduce a new carbon tax, or change the cafe standards. Something interesting to simulate would be introduce or increase a new, uh, increase the, the gasoline tax, or maybe introduce a new carbon tax and reduce the income tax. So it would be a positive net effect because energy consumption would decrease, but GDP would be sustained by reducing income tax, for example. If you want to change some parameters or implement some policies, let's take the example of the CAFE standards. You can simply click on the graph, and this little window will pop up. This is one of the variables we have in the model. So the table function, time series function. So we start from 1980. This represents historical data, historical CAFE standards that have been constant over the last few years. And there are two ways to change this parameter. You can simply click in the graph here, and the value will update. Or you can type in your values. Here you have, on the left, in this area you have all the values. Say by 2020 we want to raise the standard to 
35 miles per gallon. And we assume that it will get to, say, 45 by 2050. So we don't want cafe standards to be constant, but we want it to increase afterwards. So this will be the new cafe standards that we want to introduce to the model. If you click on OK, the model gets this input. And when you simulate the scenario, we'll take into account of this change. Are these the only four policies you have in the model? For this specific user version, yes. Okay. But there are a lot more. There are lots more in the model. These are the only ones you can address with this version. But you can uh, work with Andre, and he can put any other variable into yes. the framework that you want to. But we just didn't want to have everything up in this initial model. As models are customized, these models are unique, customized to a specific set of issues. The user the interface is also customized. So we wanted to keep it simple, not to make things too complicated, at least at this stage. But of course, a lot more policies in the social, environmental, economic sectors are available. Yes. Let's try this back then. Uh, the model Regarding, sorry, peak oil production. Yes, I will. If you let me go through the assumptions, you will see there are some there. So I will. I will wait for the questions. So that let me go through the simulation, and then you probably have some answers to your questions. Now, by looking at the assumptions, we can simulate changes in our technology and resources. So the first one refers to an increase, an improvement in oil technology or recovery. So we, look, we saw in the, in the 70s, 60s, and 70s in the United States that when we reach the peak, technology will improve faster. So there will be more investments flowing in since prices and demand will still go up, we need to invest more. This doesn't mean that we will get more oil out of the ground. That doesn't mean that. But we can simulate that at the world level at least, the closer we get to the peak, and in case we simulate starting from five years before we get to the peak, we can improve technology faster. So here you can select by which extent we will improve technology. We'll increase by 10%, 2%, 15%, and so on. Of course, technology is, in this case, recovery technology is simulated by the model, so it's endogenously calculated by the model. This would be an ex extraordinary improvement, a breakthrough improvement. Secondary, tertiary techno uh, recovery technology could be something that is out there, more too expensive right now, but we say, let's see if we can <coughs> get something different the model. And of course, technology, as you probably know, is one of the main problems, has been one of the main problems for the success of simulation models. Many models back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s simulated or projected technology to improve by a much smaller rate than it actually developed. So with this model, at least you can test different assumptions. Then the second assumption is like that. There may be, if the demand is inadequate, increases or decreases in stocks. And then that feeds back into investment in production later on. So you get an adjustment toward an equilibrium um, that represents the, the lags in reality. It doesn't impose it at, at each point. It's, it's, a, um, it's not a simultaneous solution. It's a regressive solution that solves, I think, eight times a year or something like that. So it's tracking what's going on in the economy. Then with respect to the sector analysis, for economy, we have, society, um, we have agriculture, industry, and commercial sector. For energy, we have a different energy sources and different sectors, residential, commercial, industrial, and transportation. And we tend to identify the drivers that define the behavior of each of them. In some cases, maybe the same. In some other cases, they may be different. And they need more of a detailed analysis. So we look into the sectors, not into great detail, but we look into drivers uh, for different sectors. Yes. Could you look in more detail? Yeah. You yeah, always can. Yeah. Uh, here. Uh, Basil Carl, I'm with uh, Al Gore's climate project. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that in, in Europe there, you've done a lot of energy conservation that we haven't done here. And one area that interests me is the the uh, possible, could your model calculate how much energy would be saved, how much CO2 would be reduced mm -hmm. if, for example, we did what the Japanese have done with their yes. cool biz, where in the summer months, men no mm -hmm. longer wear suits and ties, they wear open collar short sleeve shirts, Yes. They reduce the uh, the uh, temperature in the buildings, but they decrease it by 10 degrees. Mm -hmm. Could your model show that? Yes, if you identify the factor, you say by which degree your demand will change with respect to such a change in consumption and consumer behavior, that could easily be done. And we did that in a way by looking at um, energy consumption and electricity production from renewable resources. We assume that when we implement the ACORS and in the bright future scenario, the ACORS projection in the bright future scenario, 
the average U.S. consumption of or energy obtained from renewable sources will be exactly the same as the one that California has. So we can make these comparisons. Could, could your model also factor in the number of people? A lot of people get colds in the summer because mm -hmm. they're in cold rooms all summer. Yes. Could you factor in the health cost of, or the health advantage of raising the temperature in buildings in the summer? Well, you mean by health cost for the government, so the monetary terms? Certainly days where people get sick being yes. cold yes. and chilled. Yes, we represent yeah. total factor productivity which, uh, for the economy, which represents all these factors. Yes, that can be done. All the way back. Yeah. All the way back. Well, he's been waiting a long time. Yeah, all right, I'll go back. Go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to go back over here. Your, your name? John Hoffman, Work Smart Energy Enterprises. Uh, back to the gentleman who was talking about the discontinuities. Because one of the things that concerns me a lot about models that grow and you can keep adding in fact, I think what you really often need to do is drill down to the things that are really going to make a difference, as opposed to keep expanding and adding and making complex. And so he was suggesting, well, maybe methane hydrates will become a major energy source. You know, and figuring out whether that is possible is probably more important than a lot of the stuff that's in the model. Mm -hmm. Or another example, I don't. Do you have like plug-in hybrids in this model? No, not yet. Yeah, like so, plug-in hybrids are probably the most important thing that I can think of that would change the outcome mm -hmm. of your model. Let's make two two comments. Well, the first thing is that I know this model will never get as detailed as the National Energy Modeling System, the World Energy Model of the International Energy Agency, the Message Model of the IPCC, or others. Never. What we do. We take the results and we use those assumptions in our model. So if we find reasonable projections for these technologies, they can be easily, in one hour, integrated, simulated, and analyzed. That is one of the advantages of this model. The second point is that we represent conservation in the, in the transportation sector. That means a lot of things. There could be many different options. So we don't represent explicitly plug-in hybrids, but we represent what happens if we manage to save 40% of consumption. Well, I'm not objecting to that. I, mean, yeah. I think no, what no, no, you're doing just... makes a lot of sense. But, yes. no, but I mean, looked at that thing in the Washington Post yesterday. You know, you can repeat uh, things that are not <laughs> true over and over again, and people will believe them. And for 30 years, energy modelers have been doing that, <clears throat> and they've been consistently yeah. wrong. You know, yeah. not just by a little bit, by a lot. And so you take something like uh, yesterday was an instance interesting juxtaposition because you had the post with this extremely negative depressing story mm -hmm. but on the uh, car section of the New York Times they had an article about the vault and uh, mm -hmm. 120 miles per gallon equivalent with lithium ion batteries improving 10% a year mm -hmm. and yep. you know when you project that out by 2011 you have 120 130 mile per gallon car there's something you know, like fundamentally wrong with sort of like thinking about these issues in this continuous way. But I, that, but can make, that can just yeah. completely change the ballgame. No, but but you, make a very interesting, you make a very interesting point there is one, as these particular technologies or changes happen, and just kind of, you know, we can incorporate that and say, well, what would happen if they did come out with the electric car or the plug-in car that does all of this? And then let's look at their real assumptions to say, is it feasible that the battery is going to grow as powerful as this? If we have more plug-in cars, yes, it's going to reduce gasoline consumption, but it's going to increase electrical production. And by putting that in the model, you look at some of the feedback loops and other things that the automobile industry is not going to tell you about. They're going to tell you it's reduced energy consumption by less gas. They're not going to tell you the impact on electricity or something else. Now, it may be much less energy consumed from electricity. I don't know the details. But by putting that sort of thing in this model, you get the results of the broader framework. We don't have all the answers. It's a tool to analyze these things and say, well, the real story is not quite what they're saying. It's not quite as bad as what the Post is saying. It's here in the middle, and we can show you exactly okay. why. I guess what I'm suggesting is you really have to reach out <coughs> to the people that have yeah. the ideas exactly. for sure. these discontinuous changes yep. and focus on those. That, that, that's why we try to do this, is to get more input. Okay. Thank you. Also, well, just there was a one, one comment. Sorry, yeah. Yeah. Is most of the models fail because of technology development, technology improvement. Then here we don't want to give answer. We leave it up to you. You simulate the <coughs> model, you simulate your own technology development, different scenarios, and see what could happen. That's what I think is the value out of this model. Yeah. Just test different assumptions. You say, 
oil production would peak tomorrow or peak yesterday, simulate. Someone may disagree, but you have your own projection. You don't have to wait for a new report coming out. Okay, back in the back. I'm Robert Ebert, uh, Chandelier Research Corporation. Uh, two questions, one technical. I'm inferring a lot from what has been said about this model, but I take it it is entirely deterministic. Is that a fair statement? Deterministic? Yeah, well, well, so well, it's, well, it's, well, it's, well, yes. Yeah, but it's, yes, but it, we use stochastic methods to, to analyze the data and compare. Say so we look at correlation. Correlation come out of the model and use them to compare if the model is valid or not. Yes. Yeah, it can be. Most of, most of the models are from very well accepted social or economic theory that you have you managed to put together here. Uh, when you've done, you mentioned using both calibration and doing validation using an historical data set. Mm -hmm. I take it you partition the set, so you're not validating against the same data set that you use to calibrate. No, well, we we use the same. Well, we use a set of data sources. We don't use only, for example, energy information administration data. We compare with others. So the validation is, is done by comparing with different sources, not with one only, not with the one that we used to, to calibrate the model. Otherwise, it would be too easy. Right. And uh, the results question, though, I looked through your entire report here. Even in the bright future scenario, it looks like you do not project a diminishment of the greenhouse effect, the greenhouse gas. Mm -hmm. And if you do not, you also have not apparently yet included the impact on water supplies uh, globally. Uh, given those two things together, what does it potentially say about your assumption of continually expanding populations? Well, first, I would say that the bright future scenario doesn't account for any extraordinary technological improvement. So it's one of the factors that's been taken out. So it can be even more positive. Then if you take into account water, if you take into account population growth, I think you have to look at the global picture, not only the United States. So there are issues maybe with Canada, with Mexico, with Latin America that are not considering this version of the model. So of course there are some limitations and the boundaries are not, but the model, the structure of the model doesn't account at the moment for those well, important issues. Say migration in this case is exogenous, hmm. but it can easily be easily, well, it can be endogenized with respect to specific set of issues that we need to analyze. And I think the further thing is our bright scenario is not the a total solution, but it simply shows that if we do the CAFE standards, if we do renewables, if we do a reasonable amount of conservation, basically getting to the California level of uh, conservation residential, it'll have a number of positive effects. It still won't cause a reduction in CO2 emissions so that you've got to do more. And it tells you, you need to look more. There's some technological issues. There may be some more conservation issues or things like that. But the bright future is the title of that scenario. Doesn't say this is what we're recommending. It's just saying even this set of results doesn't get us to where we need to go. We need to do more. Mm -hmm. Here. I'm not so sure if you didn't cover the term of trade, how that might get back. And uh, the second item is when you do taxes, carbon tax or whatever, and I may have missed this, but do you have a way of recycling that back in? How, how do you deal with that tax? Because the biggest issue here would be, are we going to get that money back somehow right away, mm -hmm. so economically, more or less? Yes, let me start with taxes. So taxes, when government revenues increase, then they are located into ex different um, categories of expenditure. So they go back into the economy. Then you can select, some, you can simulate some policies on expenditures to allocate this tax mm -hmm. revenue. So you can take the same amount of increased tax re uh, revenues from gathering tax to reduce income tax. Exactly the same. So you give it back to the population, to households, and disposable income for households will increase while the deficit of the government will be the same. So this is feasible. And what was the first question? Uh, about the terms of trade effect, oh. in the sense that yes. if you do real GDP, you're probably missing 
yes, yes, yes. underestimating the real economic impact. Well, GMP is included, it's calculated. G GMP? Yes. But with the, what's the deflator on GMP? Uh, See, I don't recall it right now, but no. Yes. But if you take national income and deflate it by consumption deflate, you actually end up a lot better off. And it makes a lot of sense to do that because mm -hmm. one of the things you're, um, because suppose the, uh, the dollar appreciates. So then you've got a, a uh, in terms of trade, mm -hmm. moves favorably for you. So your bank for the bucks even higher. Nice. But by the way, the GDP deflator we use for the economy, real GDP in this case, just if this can help, is yeah. the one projected by the Congressional Budget Office, okay. just to make sure. It's not endogenous? No, not in this version of the model. No. Okay. No, we'll no. With that. Concerning use can you introduce yourself? I'm oh, sorry, Dave Kerner, the Tory group. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm interested in doing sensitivity analyses. Um, is there a way to, in using the model to mechanically determine what are the most sensitive variables for any given when you plug different things in, can you get the model to tell you rather quickly what's, what's a high driver? Mm. Do you want to do your little you mean you want to now? identify what are the main no. feedback loops driving the behavior of the model? Uh, yeah. This would be, um, no, this is called again value analysis yeah. applied yeah. to system dynamics, yeah. and it's fairly complex when you use highly dynamic model with a lot of nonlinearities. Okay. It is feasible, okay. but it takes time, so the model doesn't give you the right answer. If we sit down together and show you how the model works, for me as a model, or for you after, an hour or two, it would be very, very easy to understand why you get the change, which feedback loop has been triggered to produce that change. A seminar series at which we have had luminaries from across the, the energy world come in and talk about their niche. And every time they do, somebody says, uh, you know, makes the little uh, synapse connection that, well, you know, if you do this over here, then what's going to be the effect on that over there? And we've been looking for a way to take that group uh, of uh, participants, and we're talking about somewhere in the neighborhood of 150, 250 participants uh, on any given evening. We're, we're looking for a way to, to help that group begin to expand their um, understanding of the system as a whole. And we believe that this methodology, and in particular the T21 model, is probably going to be a good, uh, good way for us to do that. So we'll we'll have you guys come chat with our group a couple of times to integrate that stuff a little bit more. So, uh, Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, we'll now uh, hear a few words from um, uh, Dick Lawrence. He's with um, ASPO USA, uh, the Association for the Study of, of Peak Oil. And uh, ASPO USA has been uh, supporting the Miller Institute uh, in uh, this uh, preparation of the T21 USA. Um, do you need a place for your computer? Yeah, I'm going to plug this in. I, I know our time is limited, so I'll, I'll keep my comments short. Yeah, please. Uh, to give you a little background, uh, the history of where, where we're coming from and where we hope to take this thing. So um, I'm with ASPO USA, which is, a, I guess you could say, a, a spin-off of ASPO, the international organization. And we're a relatively new nonprofit or organization. We were founded by myself and three others in 2005 when ASPO International uh, more or less authorized the creation of na nation-level ASPO organizations. So ASPO, if you didn't know, stands for the Association for Study of Peak Oil. But it's not just about oil. It's about oil, natural gas, coal, and all other forms of resources that are, are not renewable. Uh, and, and subject to depletion. So in, uh, in 1986, I bought a book called uh, Beyond Oil, which was written by Robert Kaufman and a number of other people. And that was my introduction to two major things. One was the fact that, yeah, oil really does deplete, and, and there's a curve of depletion, the Hubbard curve. And by the way, the United States passed over that curve, over the peak in 1970, 16 years before that book was, was printed. And the second concept was the power of system dynamics to, thanks, the, the power of system dynamics to give you insight in, in, into policy decisions and, and future projections of future uh, trends and directions better than just a simple spreadsheet analysis because it has the ability to handle complex interactions in the, in the feedback loops. 
So a couple of things. You, you, you all know this already that um, we're facing, I think, a, a window of opportunity here. In the next decade, we're going to make – we have to make some critical decisions about our energy supply, where it's coming from, and how we use it. So this is one from a, a BBC correspondent. Uh, Rick Smalley, I had the opportunity to talk to him about this energy proposal, energy modeling, uh, only a few months before he passed away. But he was, along with, uh, along with um, Matt Simmons, one of the principal proponents of uh, let's understand where we're going and how to, how to deal with these problems before we dig ourselves in even deeper. And then finally, Matt Simmons, uh, as you know, if there is no plan B. We haven't got it yet. Where are we going from here and what should we be doing? So we have a window of opportunity. Like the climate change thing is a window of opportunity. At some point, there's a tipping point, and we don't know exactly where that is. Um, there's a lot of NGOs represented here. You all have interests in trying to save the world and make it a better place. And, and my focus on energy is related to the fact that none of these things work, none of these efforts we're trying to launch and improve the world. If you don't take, in count, take into account what's happening with energy, they're not going to. They're not going to work. Um, the, the end of the era of cheap energy is here now, and you know OPEC doesn't control the price of energy now. Uh, we've seen it go from ten dollars to nearly eighty dollars a barrel, and in the next ten years, I think um, we're going to see continued increases in the prices of energy, regardless of what the EIA is telling you right now. Uh, so one of the things we want to get out of this is if we've got this limited supply of fossil fuels now, it's still relatively cheap energy compared to where it's going to go. What is the best use to which we could put this fossil fuel, this gift from our planet that we have right now? What's the best things we could be doing with it besides just burning it all up in current uses? Um, this is a little exercise in, in uh, I guess, zooming away from the curve. This is an ASPO-based curve of, of presumed future oil projection. If you zoom away from this in time, you get some idea of the remarkable era that we live in now. And uh, the, the spike of oil and gas uh, availability to our industrialized civilization is a temporary thing. And the real question is, where does all that come from? Or do we, do we get that at all? Is it, is it coming from renewables or other sources? Um, I won't spend much time on this. Agriculture with a growing population heading toward 9 billion. Big, big concern is can we develop agriculture based on sustainable energy resources? With the advent of biofuels, you get another level of competition for agricultural land and water. And it isn't clear at all. I don't think there's a, a, a well understood plan that says how we get from here to there on renewable energy supplies. Or do we simply prioritize the use of energy and fo put fossil fuels into agriculture only? There's a lot of confusion. And, and, and as you know, if you follow the peak oil story, there's a lot of different opinions. Uh, confusion between reserves and flow. If you talk about Canada tar sands, for example, they'll say there's 170 billion barrels out there, but that doesn't mean you can produce it at 10 or 20 or 30 billion barrels a year. Simply put, you can't. And the best projections I've seen get you maybe to 4 million barrels a day out of Canadian tar sands. So the fact that there's a lot of reserves there, potential reserve, doesn't mean you can produce it at a, at a rate that sustains civilization, industrialized civilization and agriculture at its present rate. So th that's the thing about reserves and flow. That's one of the things we want this model to incorporate and provide better insight into. Um, so the point is that there's a lot of opinions out there and our, our interest in a model is to cut through the morass of opinions and get some fact-based, science-based, thermodynamic-based projections of our energy future and not just uh, competing opinions. Because if you're throwing opinions around, we don't get anywhere. We make no progress. And that's why we believe a model is a, the necessary first step. Um, somebody made this point already. Human brains are not numerically literate. I mean, we don't think well in terms of numbers, particularly when you've got 
exponential growth of numbers. And Al Bartlett, I don't know, he's made something like 1,600 presentations on exponential growth. And it's a great presentation. I'd urge you to see it. You can probably download it from somewhere. Uh, the other thing is understanding complex relationships with hundreds of linkages and feedback paths. The human brain, again, can't possibly encompass, encompass that level of complexity. So we want to model to do that better than our own brains can. It doesn't mean we, we put our brains on the shelf and stop analyzing and, and critical thinking, but the model on the computer is there to help us with that process. It ought to be a, a, a tool that makes us better at doing what we're trying to do. So the bottom line is we want energy policy decision. This is where we really want to go with our collaboration with, with Millennium Institute and ESF. We want this to become a tool for policy decisions. And other people were making the good point that your feedback, the feedback, there's a lot of important people here and a lot of people with a lot of connections in this room. Your feedback and your critiques of this model and the scenarios we build and the conclusions of this model are critical to making it a better model. So I invite that feedback from everybody here. So um, essentially, I just want to say a world energy model, this is where we want to take it right now. We're, we're announcing the T21 USA, and the next step that ASPO USA is supporting is making this a North America model. So we're building in Mexico database and Canada database, including the tar sands. There'll be simplified models, but hopefully it gets us closer to the truth, the reality of the relationships. It'll build in the import-export uh, components that we need to go toward the next step, which is a global energy model. And this is where I really want to take that. Um, the, the last point here is important. We want The reason this analysis and, and policy decisions based on the analysis are critical is because there are wrong directions. There are, there are dead-end paths that we shouldn't be taking. And I'm not going to prejudge what those dead-end paths are. That's for the model to assist us in making those judgments. But I can give you some examples. Uh, some things like ethanol, for example. If the return, energy return on investment is not positive, it's, if it's zero or negative, you can ask some very good questions. Why are we doing this? Uh, similarly, the, the so-called hydrogen economy, hydrogen economy. What's the cost, the energetic cost of building all that infrastructure? What's the energetic cost of transporting hydrogen around a continent? Can we do it? Do you get net energy when you're done? Um, so I'll just, uh, the, the two things we're building into the model now uh, that are critical new components. One is the import-export relationships between nations, so the, the T21 North America model will have that. The second thing, the collaboration with uh, Charlie Hall's group, ESF in Syracuse, New York, is building in energy return on investment components. That feedback path that says every, every source of energy, whether it's conventional or nuclear or, or solar panels, every source of energy you create or develop has an energy cost. And you'd better build that energy cost into the model because net energy is what we as a society use, not, not total energy. So this is just a list of questions that, uh, it's a very preliminary list, but this is, this is the reason we want to build a model, is, is because we can begin to get answers to these questions. Uh, impacts of CO2 emissions, uh, every scenario we run will track CO2 emissions, so you're going to understand the climate change consequences. Uh, the, the, the collision between biofuels and agriculture for food and the economic and, and human welfare uh, consequences of that. We want that to be out of the model. Water, water is a very important thing. A number of people brought that up today. We want this model to incorporate water resources on a global level and understand the relationship between energy development, agriculture, and water supply. That's very important. So there are lots of things that can constrain where we go in the future, and we want to try to start building in real-world constraints as we discover them, as we understand them. Uh, building in a database of energy capabilities and energy constraints uh, from all over the world so that this can more and more accurately reflect future reality and inform policy decisions. 
Uh, this is a net energy thing. I talked about that already. So again, this this big question: Where should we invest our our energetic energetic and financial capital best to get the best long long term sustainable future for energy and the outcome for the environment? Uh, this is one that this is kind of this is actually from Beyond Oil, uh, 1986, but. Uh, if you've seen the Hirsch report, which is spon uh, sponsored by the Department of Energy, um, Robert Hirsch and Roger Bezdek uh, kind of makes the same the same point. Um, so this is a summary complex. You know the history here. So T21 USA is uh, announcing today, and T21 North America will be the the next production of the collaboration of Millennium Institute and. ESF, the group in Syracuse, New York. That's the Environmental Science and Forestry State University in New York. Um, longer term, I, I, one of the things we said is uh, this will be a publicly available, um, uh, anybody can download this thing and run it. Uh, we're talking about a, a game-like interface that the po folks from ESF are working on. Uh, ideally, I'd like to see something like SimCity, an energy world like SimCity, and so we're exploring those directions. There was something recently a uh, multiplayer game, uh, World Without Oil, I think, which also got some publicity. So I call this the people's energy model. This is the way we really want to take it. Anybody can download this thing and run it kind of like it was a game with a, as a simulation, but having real data underlying that model, it's the same core, but a different interface that, that you know, a 15-year-old kid can run this thing and understand the consequences of policy decisions. I think it's a great learning tool. So uh, thanks for your attention. And these are some uh, oil and energy-related websites. ASPO USA uh, has one now. And I'll be putting a forum up on the ASPO USA website that I encourage you all to uh, participate in for discussing this model some of it will be academic, some of it will be uh, more, more general purpose questions. And, uh, and I'll just put in a plug. We have our, our annual conference in Houston this year, October 17 through 20. So I encourage you all to join us there. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Dick. Um, we'll now have uh, our last speaker. A uh, short <laughs> time is sort of running out, but. Um, uh, Alan Baer is a social entrepreneur. He created uh, Solar Quest, and he's working with us. So he started to work in the Galapagos on some uh, alt introduction of alternative energies there on the UN project. And uh, he ended up also with us eventually needing a model to, to help him uh, do his work there and also implement some of the ideas he will talk to you about right now. So, <clears throat> so what time do we have right now? And everyone wants to get out of the room in five minutes. Is, oh, yes, five, five, is that five, the? Oh, yeah. So I'll, we'll create a social contract here. I'll get, every, get everyone out in about five minutes. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I'll just get the space bar here and find one or two slides to talk about. Uh, Ten years. Is, has been commonly accepted as the period of time in which society has to make a transition or we will suffer severe consequences from global climate change. And if you look at the model uh, that is represented by the multicolored globe, uh, that's, uh, I encourage everyone to go to Science on a Sphere. It's a NASA model that looks at uh, temperature change under the business as usual scenario which can increase as much as 7, 10, 15 degrees at some time into the future. It's quite frightening. And I think that's a conservative model, in fact. Um, <clears throat> so what's the business as usual? And um, you know, what are the economic impacts of climate change? I was going to talk on this extensively. I will abbreviate what I have to say in this and go directly to the business as usual model. And we are planning an investment of some $20 trillion over the next 15, 18 to 20 years in fossil fuel technologies to power our economy. And if we do that as a planet, we will certainly have a very negative income of, of uh, outcome, which could represent 
is, uh, according to Stern, three to $12 trillion annually based upon a $61 trillion global economy. That is, five, between 5 and 20 percent of GDP <coughs> will be the impact of climate change. That will be the cost of climate change to society. I don't think we can afford to bear that cost. So we need to do something about this. Uh, what are we going to do? Um, I was going to get into a nice explanation here about uh, the broader approach uh, to the consequences that implied by narrow output measures and talk a lot about T21 in that context. Well, I think you had enough of that, so I don't need to go there. I'll just skip right on by and get to my key point here. And that is, uh, if we look at the bottom line here, uh, T21 Ecuador. Okay, what we proposed, what we did was we took the stern reviews assumption that 1% of GDP on an annual basis, approximately starting in the range of $600 trillion and increasing that to over trillion dollars a year maybe by 2030, 20, I mean, you economists know better, okay? And, and we wanted to determine for Ecuador whether that was a sufficient investment to reduce carbon emissions in Ecuador. So um, I'll provide you just some brief context to this. Um, I started off doing this work with the Millennium, uh, um, help me, the um, I'm, yeah, I'm no. getting you guys confused now. The White House Millennium Project, okay, with Hillary Clinton. And I was part of the team that was envisioning the future. And that included, in fact, even doing the National Town Meeting for Sustainable America with Al Gore. I was responsible for bringing the, uh, the youth delegation to the town meeting. And um, from that, uh, we, um, some of the partners in that project then began working with the United Nations to repower the Galapagos Islands with renewable energy technologies. So we now have some 36 partners in that project and we have over $33 million in, invested in renewable energy technologies. We'll take the islands about 50 percent renewable uh, technologies. My role in that has been uh, capacity building for all of the partners involved in the project. And I have been operating educational programs, uh, both for the school systems uh, on the islands as well as the various partners uh, to uh, basically do a lot of technology transfer and understanding of uh, the consequences of change uh, in the Galapagos. But I want to just uh, briefly give you a structure of, of what we did. Um, the, the SolarQuest was the project management team for capacity building. In the, on the box here uh, to the left, you'll see the, uh, the organizational structure that we worked in that was managing the project, which is a, a collaboration between the government of, of Ecuador and the UN, and particularly working through the Ministry of Energy and, uh, and three UN uh, agencies. Um, we built infrastructure and we did a significant amount of, and I, I promise to make this quick, I'm, I'll keep pushing forward, even though it might make sense or not make sense, okay. Um, the lo our local capacity partners included the Electric Utility, the Ministry of Education and Culture, uh, the Galapagos National Institute, uh, the local uh, technical schools. And basically what we did was we built a, uh, uh, a pervasive monitoring system where we collected data on energy from all sectors within the Galapagos economy. And we did this uh, in collaboration with the E8, which are the 10 largest electric utility companies in the world. They provided a lot of technical assistance in this. They, they did the uh, verification of our, our simulations to make sure that we really understood energy consumption. Um, we did uh, profiles that, uh, that looked at consumption in different sectors uh, and current use and what it might look like if we applied energy efficiency. Uh, what it might look like if we had different renewable energy resources. Uh, we created models for the grid. Uh, this is a 24-hour grid model. Uh, we then e extrapolated, uh, and, and this is all being done, by the way, by a collaboration of 16-year-old high school students and college students. And this is a very important point, which I'll conclude with. So uh, we then went on to look at a national model for Ecuador, and we made some assumptions about 
if we applied what we learned in the Galapagos Islands uh, to the national electric grid in Ecuador, could 1% of GDP, coming back to the Stern Review, could 1% of GDP actually reduce carbon emissions in Ecuador to below 1990 levels? So well, I'll just go through this very quickly. We did a lot of modeling then on the national uh, energy uh, of Ecuador and uh, you know, looked at, at projected growth in different provinces. This is for the Galapagos. Uh, then what we managed to do, and I, you know, I promised this was going to be about anatomy of how we did this, but basically we had a research team of students in the Galapagos that consisted of high school students, consisted of college students, both from Ecuador and the U.S., they were, had a lot of technical support provided by a group of utilities worldwide. All of the data that was collect, uh, collected was simulated and verified by those electric utilities. We then worked with the national government and a number of agencies in Ecuador uh, with uh, Andrea's team uh, transferring data to the University of Bergen. Andrea taught a, a program this uh, past uh, spring uh, six-week program on systems dynamic and a team of four modelers, students within the program at University of Bergen, built the Ecuador model. Then we transferred all this data to, uh, including the model, to Middlebury College. Um, and we then, uh, Andre and I, uh, spent a weekend workshop. I spent most of the semester team teaching a course at Middlebury College uh, to create uh, um, not only the model but do analysis utilizing the data and you know this I'll just show you very quickly what the outputs were here um, we realized that uh, electricity uh, generation from fossil fuels could be stabilized um, that um, that uh, fossil fossil fuel generation in the electrical sector could be reduced by greater than 50 percent that the, and we looked primarily at energy efficiency, uh, that $5 billion in avoided consumer costs uh, representing roughly $60 per capita would be realized over the period of the, of the study through 2025, that consumer investment portfolio of $1.7 billion would be a part of the program, meaning poverty alleviation for a lot of poor consumers in Ecuador. <coughs> uh, that the per capita energy consumption could be reduced by approximately 33%. Um, and then finally, we answered our question, is 1% of GDP sufficient to bring us back to pre-1990 levels? No, it's going to be a lot more than that. How much? We don't really know. But I started making some uh, assumptions about that, and um, I'm not going to go through those details. I just want to close here with, with one key issue, and that is that we're looking at spending $20 trillion through 2025 to replace aging infrastructure and provide uh, electricity consumption uh, production for, for new demand. If we do that, we will have serious negative consequences. We where, can't where go on that this, pathway. This is being invested in the U.S. or in Ecuador? Worldwide. Oh, okay. Globally, $20 trillion will be invested globally. And, you know, go to the, uh, the International Energy Agency website. You can download a lot of materials about this. They projected an alternative scenario where, where we can invest in renewables and energy efficiency and, you know, other low carbon emitting uh, technologies. And they're recommending that we make a transition of this $20 trillion investment over the next 25 years. That is a, a very tough challenge. And I think that that T21 really provides a tool of assessing how we can do that. But how do we move ahead and how do we create a, a pathway where we get consensus on this process? That's the real challenge that we're facing. And the point of my talk is really about we need to harness our youth. Um, I've been lecturing uh, in universities uh, for this past year and I can tell you that many students are not getting the information that they want and they need. They're concerned about their future and what these scenarios may represent to them. My sense of how to get these gentlemen's work into the world 
conversation about energy and climate change is to harness a student labor force. What I demonstrated here was that we were able to take secondary school children, we were able to take college students, we were able to collaborate with government, we were able to collaborate with industry and, and use high order thinking skills, develop high order thinking skills in these people and then use the most advanced technologies and modeling available to us to, to demonstrate that we can harness that sector, the education sector, and I can tell you that my, my estimate is that within a year or two we could probably harness as many as 2,000 researchers in universities across the United States to achieve this globally, and I think we need to take that step. Thanks. All right, so I think we have sort of reached uh, toward the end of uh, this presentation, a bit over time. I hope that uh, you have a good understanding now of what this uh, T21 is. And I think that, obviously, as we did say earlier, this is working progress. And uh, what we all try to take home from this today is that, um, again, where can such a model be used? I think in policy making, but we just heard, I think, very much so also in, in education. Education both sort of for the next generation of people who will have to make decisions very soon, and also, I think, in, in the media area. So, again, sort of that's where, again, there's a good use for, for this model, but also uh, in research and development. I think that the model also can indicate uh, where uh, are areas in needs of, of new technologies, of uh, uh, new science uh, to support basically uh, the, the quest of wh where do we need to go. And again, we cannot ha get it wrong, as it was said before, and we have to make sure that we take the right uh, uh, um, uh, road. And there's a big question mark there on one of the slides. How are we going to do that? I think, again, I think this model I is something which can be used to try to answer some of these questions. Uh, uh, for the future. So we, we are very much looking like for, look forward to uh, get some uh, feedback from you. You have our report, uh, you have the, the CD. Um, we will be around here for a little discussion where you want to talk to us uh, for a few more minutes. Um, and we hope that we can work together. Because I think it's very important that uh, we do get further feedback and opportunities uh, to work with you. As mentioned also, uh, we, we can do uh, um, customized models for certain needs. Um, we're looking at, at the game issue already also, so hopefully something will happen there on that side with different partners. Um, so certainly we're open to, to many different ideas, suggestions, uh, and partnerships from, from your own end. Again, so I want to thank you for coming. I want to thank my colleagues here, uh, Jed Schilling, uh, Andrea uh, Bessie, and also the ones you haven't seen, but we're working in the background on this the, the last few weeks uh, for their uh, contribution. And not the least, again, also for all the supporters uh, who have been helping us all along here to make this a reality. So thank you very much.